It's official. We're live. Uh, happy hour today. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to the show. My name is Jim McKay, and this is PT Pintcast, a podcast that saves physical therapists from missing out on amazing insight, remarkable ideas, and motivational stories in the world of physical therapy. Cheers to you guys. We want to know where you're watching from. Uh, we've got eyeballs on this thing now that we're uh, we're doing a live stream available via our Facebook and our Twitter pages at PT Pinecast. Let us know where you're watching, where you're listening, whether you're watching it live, whether you're watching the replay. Just kind of say hi, say what's up, and uh, what you kind of want to feel of where you guys are located. Uh, great show for you tonight. Uh, Eddie Ernst is here. Yeah, we're going to talk about uh, some vestibular stuff. We're going to get into some uh, PTA leadership as well. Uh, do you want to remind you guys to subscribe to the show? It is free. When you hear subscribe, you're like, well, how much, man? Uh, podcasts are free to subscribe. And that just means you get notified whenever there's a, a new episode. So you never miss anything. We don't want you guys to miss, miss out. So subscribe on iTunes, on Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you consume your audio, wherever you put the audio in your ear hole. Uh, let's see. Uh, coming up, we've got uh, some shows for you tonight. Mark Siolik and Sarah Cruiser at 6 o'clock talking about PT Health Study. We'll get into more of what is on the horizon. want to say thanks to our friends at Owens Recovery Science for bringing you the first round. OwensRecoveryScience.com, your single source for PTs looking for a certification for personalized blood flow restriction rehabilitation training. Find them online at OwensRecoveryScience.com. Uh, find their podcast online as well. It's called the Owens Recovery Science Podcast. Don't know where they come up with the name for that, but they get deep into BFR on their show. We're saying hi to uh, to Daniel in DeKalb, Illinois, I'm guessing. I-L? I-L. It just looks like two. You got you know what I mean? You're confusing me, Daniel. Uh, sipping on an angry orchard. Salute. Salute, Daniel. I don't have my glass filled yet. We'll do that in the first round uh, is completed. But uh, Daniel from DeKalb, sipping on the angry orchard. Take a look at that angry orchard. Ask yourself, where is that made? It's made in my hometown, where I'm located right now, the Pride of Walden, New York. That's all we got going for us here. Uh, so let's, uh, let's uh, bring in our first guests of the night. Without further ado, Eddie Ernst, PTA, rise. And there he is. How's it Eddie, going, Jimmy? Welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Thanks doing for well. Me. I'm doing very, very well. Uh, glad to have you on. Glad to have you on now that we're doing video stuff, which is a little bit new for yeah. me, being a radio guy. I was used to either the person was in the studio, and I liked that a lot, or um, or it was all headphones, right? It was all like, uh, you know, we're just doing things via phone or via internet connection, stuff like that. So uh, appreciate you doing this. Now we got body language going in, which actually comes yeah. up a lot in patient communication. Absolutely. We'd like to get away the heart, the, the difficult questions first, Eddie. Sure. What are we drinking? So my favorite of all time, the Blue Moon, Blue with Moon. orange juice. So if you don't have, it's normally garnished with uh, right. orange peel, but if you don't have that, you just take a couple chugs, a little orange juice, a little swish swish, boom, now it's garnished. That's a professional man of leisure. That is a quality mm. quality move right Very there. much a man of leisure. I uh, I picked this up at the gas station, because why not? I'm sure. doing Goose, the Goose Island IPA, okay. and this sure. one is an organic can, so I feel like, you know, like I'm just, I'm really drinking a lot today. So um, as I pour this in there, uh, make sure we get uh, Eddie's socials on the screen. Uh, Casey Klein, Phoenix as well. Casey Klein, good to, uh, good to see you. And so cheers, Eddie. I'm going to give myself really, really heavy pour. Uh -oh. That's good juice right there. Um, let's see. Let's start with this. Uh, you've been known as the guy really to, uh, to bring into in terms of vestibular. How'd you get excited into vestibular issues? What about vestibular patients and working with those people really excited you? Um, well, first, I just want to, uh, the connection, I don't know if it's my end or yours, but it's kind of scratching in and out. So hopefully I'm at least coming through clear for you. Me. Um, perfect. Um, it started actually on a clinical rotation. So my first long-term clinical rotation was in an outpatient clinic out in uh, Independence, Missouri at Blue Ridge Physical Therapy. Um, and I didn't know it was vestibular. I thought it was just a normal outpatient. So got there and really just kind of getting involved with, with the PT and probably 60 to 70% of my caseload was vestibular. And just f seeing number one was the BPPV, like just seeing how quick you can make a dramatic change in somebody's oh. life. Like pretty much the only thing you can like medical condition that you can literally cure with your hands in five right. minutes, right. With somebody that's like the only thing that I can find that you are literally curing somebody 
um, right. you know, in five minutes, right? And then the second part was the vestibular treatment, right? So like the vestibular hyperfunction, people are just dizzy, you know, car wrecks, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I was just seeing a lot quicker results. Um, and then again, just a lot of like the quality of life was turning around a lot quicker. Um, compliance with uh, home exercise plans, generally speaking, was a lot easier too. Um, I was just seeing a lot more results a lot quicker with the vestibular than I was with ortho. Um, and you know, there's healing timelines with ortho. So that definitely sure. obviously plays a role in it, but I was just loving seeing like the quick results. Um, and also, you know, if I'd be lying, if there wasn't a little bit of sadist in me, right. Normally with ortho, you're trying to avoid the pain, but with right. vestibular, you have to make them a little bit worse to make them a lot of bit better. So when you do stuff with them, they're like, Oh, it makes me, Oh, I'm super dizzy. It's like, yep, do that 10 more times for me and yeah. then you'll feel better. So, so, so uh, how, do you, how do you pitch that? Right? Like you, do you prepare someone like when you know, Hey, I, I got someone, I got someone I can help. So I'm excited, yeah. but I'm also a sadist. You said it, not me. No, um, yeah, no. How do you, wh wh how do you communicate? How do you set them up? Or do you, I mean, I'm, I'm just honest with them like that. And that's all you have to be like, I try to, um, I had a really good, uh, uh mentor at, physical when I was there or a lot of good mentors actually, but one of them was more specifically on the chronic pain side. So she helped me a lot with really targeting my like nocebo language versus placebo language and that kind of thing to make sure that I'm framing things in a way of setting expectations versus telling them that they are going to feel dizzy. Right. So Give me an example, give me an example of nocebo language and, and uh, placebo. Um, so um, if I'm going to have them do an exercise, like, so like I, the, the standard is like a yaw pitch and roll, right? Head movements on there. So I'm saying, all right, we're going to do this. You might get dizzy with it. It might stir you up. If you do, that's okay. That's normal. That's expected. We want that because that's how we know we're challenging you. If you don't get it, number one, awesome. Like that's great that you're not feeling symptoms because you're getting better, right? But we want to feel a little bit of symptoms. If you don't, that's okay. If you do, it's okay. If it's too much, that's perfectly fine. You know, let me know. We'll, we'll alter everything that we need to do. Right. It's all just about setting that expectation and letting them know that they're in charge. You know, some people take it to the nth degree and they just want to put themselves at 10 out of 10 dizziness every time. Right. Um, and those ones can be a little bit more challenging because you have to kind of rein them in. But most people are, are pretty good about saying, OK, yeah, it's stirring me up, but I'm still like in a comfortable level and I'm letting it, you know, settle back down. So giving them that time to let everything calm down as well um, is vitally important, because if you send them home worse, just like with ortho, though, too, if you send sure. them home worse than when they came in, you're not going to get by and they're not going to come back. But if you can send them home feeling better, which you can, um, a lot of times they'll, they'll keep going. So you just want to make sure that you're saying, you know, setting the expectation that you are going to exacerbate, you know, you're expecting to exacerbate their dizziness, but that's a good thing. And that that'll get better over time. Setting expectations in yep. physical therapy, in clinical stuff, in, in communications, in any, in relationships. Yep. Um, setting expectations is really, really good. Um, I didn't treat a whole lot of, of vestibular patients, but in my last clinical as a student, I did. And just exactly what you're saying, when you have someone walk in who is saying, man, I just, I, I don't get out of bed yep. and you know, I, I it's, it's I, you know, I can kind of suffer through work. And when they, they literally look at you, like, what did you do? They just yeah. pick up like, what did you do? I mean, I was thinking back to well before I was ever headed into, into the healthcare field. When I was leaving high school, I had a really, really great high school physics teacher and super personal with a guy, like one of the nicest guy in the world kind of people. And I was sure. two years into college and, and somebody had told me through the grapevine, yeah, I remember the physics pe uh, teacher from high school, like he hasn't gotten out of bed in like six months. Wow. He was admitting that he had contemplated suicide because it was so bad. Wow. And he wound up getting the, the, he met the right provider at the right time, got the right treatment and he was able to literally get his life back. I mean, his life, you know, if you get some of these patients, their life is stolen from them in terms of a vestibular issue. If you can give them that, or you can mitigate that and give them a few extra hours a day and a few extra hours a day, that's, you're right. That's a big deal, man. So good for you. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's really good for that. Like you said, the right time, right place. And that's really all it came. Cause if I didn't have that clinical rotation with uh blue Ridge physical therapy, I, I honestly never would have would have known and never would have really been involved in it because you know for even for pts you guys get i think a little bit more than we do as ptas but right. you know if memory serves in school i got like a and p on the vestibular system and like that was about it like none of the uh oh gosh practicals were on vestibular or anything you know because it's not that common that, that right. you see that on there so you know it was um 
if it, if I didn't have that clinical, I, I really wouldn't have found um, you're, loving doing it yeah, and you're getting you're his passion about it. I like that. Uh, can't let this comment go. Daniel says a sweet shirt, which we have to acknowledge there. <laughs> the live stream. Thanks, is Daniel. This is my this is my party shirt. This is my. And that leads, to, that leads to a great question, which you're talking about right there. Um, Barnett Keat, can a PTA get certified in vestibular? It's a great question because I, I don't know the answer. If so, through who? Like, can you can you get this? Like, what? what yeah. What, so what? the the certification is um, like using that term is is for me at least it's a funny term, right? It depends on what your definition is because certification you can be a certified you know whatever anybody can have a certification in there. Um, so yes, you can. The APTA doesn't have any certifications for it like they do for like board cer uh, board certified specialists and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it falls under the neurology umbrella. Um, but yes, you can, uh, Emory has a really, really great course. Um, that's kind of considered the, the gold standard, um, cause it's like a week long with intensive, like just a ton of stuff in there. So Emory's kind of the gold standard. Um, I don't know if they let PTAs because they go over the evaluation part of it. Um, but you'll have to double check that. Um, other than that, I got mine through uh, American Musculoskeletal Institute uh, mm -hmm. out of Georgia with uh, Cody Phillips and, and Destiny Hebert. Hebert, Hebert. Um, and then I'm working with right now uh, Evidence CEU um, at a, with Mickey Shaw and Stephen T. Arena uh, out of Chicago. And they have a vestibular cert um, through them where they have three different parts. And then I'm, I'm working with them to create like a PTA competency uh, cool version of it so that way you know we don't go as in depth with the evaluation portion we really i still think that ptas need to really fully understand the evaluation portion and like what the pt is looking for in that um but we won't go as in depth about going through like all the red flags and things like that that need immediate referral um but we'll still go over that so i'm working with them on on changing some of the things in there so we have a pta competency level one level two um and then they have a three level uh certification for the vestibular rehab um, and there's the Balance Institute. American Balance Institute has one. Um, I think Vita has one as well. I'm not 100 percent sure on that. Um, but yeah, there's a ton of ton of places out there that'll that'll teach it because um, there's not enough of us that that know it to be honest. PTs and PTAs. Barnett, and a great question right there. Feel free to drop the questions or comments below if you're watching the stream. If you're watching the replay, just shout at us replay to let us know you're watching afterwards. Uh, yeah. you, you did mention uh, some people you're getting to, to work with and kind of help with. You, you you had a foray into this this world, podcasting for a little while, yeah. and you, you made it way longer than, than most shows. Most shows <laughs> make it like five episodes before they, they flame out. Um, talk about your first show because sure. it's still out there in the ether. And yep. that's about the new show that you're going to be involved with. Sure. Yeah. So the first one that I did, I did with my, my, my good friend, Evan Singler out of uh, Florida. Um, so it was the PTA, PTA tapes podcast. So it was, we, our aim was to have like the only, well, we didn't want it to be the only, but we were the only uh, PTA led and PTA specific uh, podcast. So we have maybe 20 episodes or so um, out. We've talked to a number of different people. We talked vestibular, we talked manipulations, we talked to Jeff Moore, we talked to Cody, we talked to Sean Bagby, um, just a lot of different people out there. Um, I think we should have mostly PTAs on there, PTAs. Uh, Kim Nartger, I always fumble her name and I feel terrible for it, um, but she's uh, in the Northern United States, she's a PTA that owns a clinic. Uh, so we talked to her about, you know, what things that she, issues that she ran into and how she, um, interviews PTs to make sure that, you know, her as the owner versus the PT being under, you know, under her in the business sense, um, you know, how that dynamic works and how she makes sure that she's going to work well with them. Um, so we have that one on there. Times changed and we both got kind of busy. So unfortunately yeah. that one kind of fell through the cracks, but all the episodes are still out there and a lot, a lot of great content out there. Um, and then right now I'm working with, uh, again, Stephen T arena to, to start up the dizzy discussions, uh, podcast. So that one is, uh, yeah, um, that one's more focused on, uh, vestibular. So we have it, he had a, a couple of pre-recorded episodes that he had already done and those ones are out there. Um, and then right now we're working on just getting more, um, interviews. We have three so far, I think, um, but we're trying to get a, a, a stack of them ready to go so that way we can have more consistency and, and making sure that we can put out content for everybody. Cool. All right. That's cool. And Dizzy Discussions, uh, iTunes, Spotify, the whole nine, yeah. the usual, yeah. usual assessments. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, another great question coming in. Feel free to keep them coming in the comments, either on Twitter or on Facebook. Casey's got a good one. As a physical therapist assistant, how do you stay within your scope of practice and not cross the line in during evaluation? I think you kind of tipped off your, your or part yeah. of your answer, which is you should know about it. Yep. You should be informed. You're, otherwise, like, you know, 
uh, you're assisting, you, you, you should be actively involved. Absolutely. Uh, great question. How do you stay within the scope of practice? What, what are the things that you keep in mind? So the number one thing is I'm not making the final determination, right, on anything. Um, so that's like really where the evaluation part comes in, right? The evaluation is not the objective test. The evaluation is not doing the test. The evaluation is what does all of this information mean and what do I need to do with it right now, right? So for for me, I'm I feel very strongly that if we're going to look at the PT and the PCA relationship as it's you know stated by many people as like an MDPA, right? What does the PA do? The PA does do evaluations, right? But everything's looked over by the MD. Sure. When things are going haywire, you defer to the MD, right? What for me, you know, I feel comfortable doing a lot of the objective tests, a lot of the objective measures, um, screening and things like that. Um, I'm not the one making the final decision, right? So if something's going like I had a lady in home health today. Um, who we're seeing supposed to be seeing for like leg strengthening and balance and things like that. But I walk in, she has significant cervical pain um, and had a fall like a day ago. So I can either just leave, call the PT and RN said, Hey, she fell and you know, she, her neck hurts and there's nothing I can do about that. And I'm not going to treat her today because something might be wrong. Or I can do what I did, which is I'm going to do a cervical assessment, right? I'm going to play around with her neck a, a little bit gently. I'm going to test these things. I'm going to ask these red flag questions because if A, B, and C add up and there's a big red flag, like I'm getting on the phone with the nurse that time that day right. or the MD and saying, Hey, we need to do something ASAP versus leaving it to chance and saying, oh, well, the PT can come check you out next time, right? right? Everything cleared out. So I'm still going to talk to the PT and say, hey, you know, do you think you, do you want to see her next visit? This is what I found. You know, do you want to see her and check her out fully? Or do, do you think we're good to go? You know, so it that's saves, where it is. It saves time, right? I mean, oh, yeah, for time. Sure. listen, if you, if it's within your scope of practice and that, I mean, that, that's the, the thing I want to reiterate, which we've talked about before is know it, know your yeah. state scope of practice, like know it back of your hand you shouldn't have to say well i think or maybe uh-uh know that thing ice cold print it out walk around with it for two years until you know it cold um because that can save some time and, and oh, really really save uh save a, a patient some when you're working with vestibular issues or whatever it might be yeah you know some some real issues or because you don't know when that next appointment might come absolutely and, and that's all it is it's it's knowing knowing your scope of practice knowing your own right knowledge and, and in the pt scope of practice and pretty much every single one of them it says you know, you're delegating tasks to the PTA, knowing what, like within their scope of knowledge, within their area of expertise, right. like all of that stuff. Right. So as a new grad PTA, you know, coming out the gate still, you know, like I was like, still like, am I supposed to be here? Do, are you sure I should have a license right now? Like my PT is not going to give me, you know, the insanely complex CVA with also M with also MS and everything like that. Right. right. They know like, okay, he's still fresh. He's still kind of getting his feet wet. So you have to know your own knowledge. For me, I feel very, very comfortable with vestibular, right? Ortho, I'm, I'm because I've been so involved with vestibular in my works so much. Ortho, I'm not so much. So ortho, I defer a little bit more quickly to the PT right. in terms of, hey, come check things out. But vestibular, I have no problem going through like an ocular motor, um, we'll call it an assessment slash exam, um, and reporting that back to the PT, right? And, mm -hmm. and that's all it is, is just knowing what you know and communicating with the PT. If you have a really good relationship with a PT um, and they trust you and you trust them, like there, there's really no limit on what you can do because they no. know that you have your back and they have your back. So yeah. know, know your knowledge, know your scope of practice and you know you should, shouldn't at least run into too right. many issues. And I would say one thing to add, if you use that word just, if you say, I'm, well, I'm just oh, yeah. a PTA, like get yeah. out, right? Yeah. Get out. Never adjust, right? If we use just then, you know, it's just a PT, you know, we have to defer to the MD, but you know, nobody, nobody is just right. We all have mm -hmm. our level of expertise and our level of experience and, and knowledge, um, that, that helps us, you know, get people better. So you're never just anything because you know, something better than somebody with a higher degree. I know vestibular better than 90% of MDs because they don't treat it. You know, it's no fault of their own. Sure. I know vestibular better than them. Like a spine surgeon, go ask them how to treat vestibular. They're not going to know because it's not their expertise, right? That's not, no, 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 nothing against them, but that's not their area of expertise. So I'm not just a PTA to them. I know what I'm doing. Sure. I'm not going to cut into somebody's spine, but yeah. they will because they know what they're doing. So yeah. well, cheers to that. Uh, let's Absolutely. stay in the world of vestibular. You're saying do more than, than VOR times one. What's that mean to you? So, um, when, when you don't treat vestibular often, you know, as, as a lot of people don't, you know, right. let's just be honest, they, they don't get it that often. Um, when you don't treat it that often, a lot of people defer to the one thing that they remember and know, which is just VOR1, which is right, fixed target, I stay fixed on the target, back and forth. And so I, we've gotten patients sometimes where they've 
gone to another PT or their MD and they say to just do that, you know, 50 times, three times a day and they didn't get any better. It's like, well, that's because that's not what you need, right? So that's where the having a specialist, like somebody that dives into the research, that dives into the vestibular, goes and takes courses, like really wants to know what it is, um, really comes in handy, right? That's why we have pediatric specialists, we have neurology specialists, like the whole nine yards, we have vestibular specialists as well. Sure. And if you don't know vestibular specialists and, and or vestibular well, um, and you're not in a rural area where you just have to be a jack of all trades regardless, refer out, right? Know, right? know your limits. I don't know some things and I'm not gonna treat a pediatric patient. I don't know what I'm doing with it. I'm gonna defer to a pediatric, somebody that treats pediatrics. So it, when it comes to the vestibular, a lot of people default to, again, the, the VOR times one. But what are we looking at? Why are they dizzy? Are they dizzy because they have neuropathy and their brain is not processing the information well from their, from their walker, from their eyesight? Um, from their inner ear system? Do they have a concussion? Do they have a history of head trauma? Um, do they have a um, acoustic neuroma, right? Do they have Meniere's? Do they have um, ocular motor deficits? Do they have a neurological deficit, right? Is it a stroke that they had, right? There's a lot of different things that can cause dizziness and a lot of things that we can treat in uh, vestibular. Um, is it just a habituation thing, right? Do they just get dizzy? Have they just been laying down in a bed in a hospital for a month with COVID and now their vestibular system isn't working as well because they've been supine for a month. And now all it is is that they're just sitting up and they're getting really dizzy. Well, you know, is it their blood pressure? No. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. then it must be vestibular. So let's work on that. And that's just somebody, a progressive thing going up. Somebody's got habituation, starts doing VOR. Um, that's going to make them really, really sick. Yeah, really exactly. Sick. And if you don't know how to tailor the tailor the exercises or how to make an objective, then you're just going to make them worse, right? right? If you just say do this and don't give them any way to measure how fast or how far they're turning, right? You're going to be at a ten to ten dizziness and be miserable the entire time. It's like here you go, everybody who walks in. I don't really know. Just do like fifty bicep curls three times yep. a day. Like why? I don't know. It feels yeah, good, and sure. I like the curls, so it might work. If uh, maybe not, how bad can it be? Exactly. Uh, so so do more. I mean, and if, and again, like really, the two take home messages is. Make sure you know what you're prescribing. Yep. Because you're, you're. I know it looks like. Well, how can, how bad could it be? I'm having their head move back and forth. You're working with a lot of those systems you just rattled off right there. Mm -hmm. A lot of those things come into play, and not all of them benefit from that. Yep. And the second is, it, if you are not the specialist in this, refer out. Exactly. Just like anything else, if you don't know, refer out. Like that. You do, I've seen countless times pe patients say that they, and, and clinicians too, they respect you more for saying, I don't know, than just throwing spaghetti at the wall, right? And that's a lot of what I learned at physical is a lot of their stuff is really trying to target specifically what is causing their dizziness. Where is the deficit versus, okay, you're dizzy, let's try 50 things, see what, what works, and then right. just kind of go from there, right? It, it just doesn't make sense. We have protocols for ACLs, we have protocols for shoulders and hips. You know, why not have a protocol for, for vestibular? Looking forward to this podcast again with the Dizzy Discussions. Dizzy Discussions podcast, yeah. Will there be any Dizzy Bat played during? I mean, I'm just going to throw out an idea, but that could be fun if you do Dizzy Bat. Not a bad idea, actually. That wouldn't be too bad. You start off each episode with seeing who could go the furthest after doing <laughs> a Dizzy Bat in their front lawn. Uh, moving from vestibular, we'll go to something else that you're really passionate about. Sure. And I'll throw this comment. Clinical supervision is not the same as business supervision. Correct. So one thing I've seen um, in a number of, of posts on um, like the doctor of physical therapy and groups and on Facebook and the physical therapy practice and education groups, right. um, there'll be times where a PT posts in there that their director of rehab is a PTA and they're telling them to do X, Y, Z, or they're interviewing for a job and, and the director is a PTA. And, you know, there's some people that are like, yeah, there's no worries. Go for it. All good to go. Um, and other people, oh, no, that's that's bad. Can't do that. That's conflict of interest. Can't do that. Can't have somebody you're supervising also supervise them. Um, there's also states that have laws like that as well. So like in California, you can't be a PTA and treat and be a, a director, run a clinic. They say that that's a conflict of interest. Did not know that. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a couple, one or two others, I think, but I was, I did a clinical in California. So that's where I learned it at. Um, but th that's where it's important to, Hey Vincent, <laughs> uh, that's where it's important to, differentiate the two, right? So I am a uh, director of rehab right now at a skilled nursing facility. We have uh, also outpatient home health, the whole nine yards, right? So I am the supervisor of uh, OT and, or two OTs and a PT, two PTs, and then some PRN people as well. Um, ultimately what it comes down to, like we talked to before is communication, right? I'm right. not telling them what 
plan of care to make, right? I'm not telling them how many visits they need. I'm not telling them when to discharge. Everything I do is on the business end of the, the supervision, right? So if they're not meeting productivity, it's my job to address that, right? If they're running into an issue with a patient not wanting to do uh, treatment, it's my job to address that, right? If they don't get along with a nurse for some reason, which they all do, it's my job to address that, right? So as the business side, I'm their supervisor. When they have a question about what they should do about a specific situation, like that's, they go through me for that, right? To ask me so that way I can make the decision for them so that, that way, you know, they don't have to worry about that. That's my job as the business supervisor. Clinically, I'm still deferring to them, right? When we have discharges coming up, I'm going to them. It's like, hey, do you feel like this person's ready for discharge? Or if I've been seeing the most, hey, they've been doing X, Y, Z. I think they're ready to go. Like, what do you think? You did the progress note two days ago. Do you think they're good to go? Right. So I'm still clinically deferring to them on the business side. I am, you know, running everything and making sure that everybody's staying on top of their work and completing their documentation in time and everything like that. So, you know, there's a, there's a difference between the two and they're completely separate. You know, there's no conflict of interest in and of itself, right, of having a PTA as a director of rehab. Now, are there PTAs out there that do overstep their bounds and tell people and PTs that they need to make people have a certain plan of care frequency? Sure, absolutely. But how is that any different than a PT telling you sure. how to do your job, right? Or somebody that's not a healthcare provider telling you how to do your job or an MD telling you how to do your job. There's just as much, if not more, uh, conflict of interest on that side than there is for for PTAs. So there, there's just a difference between those two. And, you know, hopefully people with this will will understand that it, it's different, right? You're going to have whether that person is a PTA or PT or MD, if they're telling you how to do your job, they would do that regardless. That's just a bad manager overall, right? Or they have a lot of pressure from sure. from up top telling them that they have to do that. It's not um, an issue of the license, it's an issue of that person and the sure. management. That's the issue. It's not the license. Uh, I was going to ask something similar, but Vincent beat me to it in the comments below. Any pushback from the PTs? Um, no, um, not really. Um, we've, I mean, I've, I've only been there a short time so far, but, you know, everything we get along with, there was a little bit of a learning curve for for me going from outpatient to a sniff. So they, they were really great at helping with that um, and, and helping me transition there. But there hasn't really been too much... Um, pushback one way or the other. You know, I, I told them from the get go, like my job is the manager. I'm going to default to you guys for everything. That's not my decision to make. Um, I always have my, my, my litmus test that I call it for, for PTs is I, I always do, tell them that I'm your supervising PTA, just like as a joke. And I did that in my other clinic and the PTs loved it. Um, but they, they, you know, they got, they got that it was a joke and everything and right. the same thing with, with the PT here. So, um, you know, there, there really hasn't been any pushback. Thankfully, yeah. the, the PTs are all, all been great and, you know, they do their job really well and they make my job really easy. That's good. Great question, Vincent. Well, my, my follow up or that or the, the one after that is how did you pitch yourself to land in that position? Because it's not typical. The reason we're highlighting this is as a PTA managing and being a business supervisor, how did you fall into that? How did you pitch yourself to, to land? It must have been a hell of a pitch because it's not typical. To sure. How did you get there? So I was really, once I just like, well, I always knew that I wanted to move up into management position, um, like four minute, four months into working full time. I knew like just being, not just being, but you know, being a staff clinician just sure. wasn't for me full time uh, for the rest of my career. I, I just wasn't fulfilled enough in that position. Um, so once I decided I was ready to kind of, kind of move up, it was literally just putting out application after application after application, and then, um, come in prepared with questions about the job, about productivity, expectations and all that stuff. Um, in, in outpatient, as I've kind of started diving into it in outpatient, it's not very, um, common, right? You're absolutely right. In right. skilled nursing, it's actually very common to have right. a PTA as a DOR. Um, best bet or best guess on that is it's a little bit cheaper to have a, pay the PTA salary plus the DOR than it is to play the PT salary plus the DOR um, is my best guess. Um, but it was really just putting out application. I put, pro put out probably 50 applications um, yeah. and got interviews at maybe five or six. Um, so, and it's really just about volume, at least at that end, uh, more than anything, you're just putting everything out. Um, as far as the pitch, um, you know, I pitched that I wanted to be a leader, right? That I, it, it's like I just told you, I just wasn't fulfilled in my current position. Like I wanted more. I want to help be 
you know, a change and advocate for patients and advocate for clinicians in a way that you really just don't have the ability to do as a staff clinician. Um, and so that was kind of my biggest thing is I just need more and I want more and I want to grow. Did you feel guilty at all when you said, I went through school, I got here, I'm a clinician, this is what I went to school for, yeah. you recognized you wanted something different. It wasn't better or worse. It just wasn't what you were doing and you saw an opportunity. Do you ever feel guilty? Guilty about leaving or? Yeah, or not doing it. You know what I mean? And the reason I'm asking is completely personal is sure. I went to your school to be a, a physical therapist. I treated for two years and then I decided to go 100% communication physical therapy and sure. 0% clinical. Um, and I felt terribly guilty at first. I'm now thinking, hey, maybe I'll maybe I'll go do like 80-20 because I actually miss it a lot. But sure. did, is there any of that psychology in there? Um, not so much. Um, because once I uh probably halfway through school, if not a little bit sooner, I knew like ultimately I always wanted to own my own business as well. Like I wanted to own a clinic too. So I've always had the desire for more. Um and and that so that really never really played a role for me at least. Um yeah because you know, I, I, I'm still doing what I love, right? And ultimately as clinicians, our number one job is patient advocacy, right? So if you're doing patient advocacy, you're still doing your job as a work. Yeah, right? really. So um, on, on my end now I'm able to, you know, and I don't always get my way obviously, but I'm able to push a little bit harder to get certain things and, and to get these patients checked out or do whatever it may be, right? And so I'm trying to, you know, work my way up um, You're a different high enough work, to that. Right? I mean, you know, things happen you know, to use a baseball analogy because that's what I default to what I know. Like sure. you can control a game, the game differently standing on the mound or behind the plate or in right field. Yeah. You you can have control, exactly. games, but where do you want to stand? Neither of them are better or worse. They're just better or worse for you. If you got to go yep. stand in right field and you hate it, then it sucks. But if you love right field, then right field's great. So asking yourself that question, you said halfway through school, I knew I wanted to do it. Great. Run with it. Good for you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It was definitely uh good, good to kind of know that and just go, go with it. Yeah. Vincent dropped another good question. Hardest part, learning curve decisions you've made that you would do differently. What have you learned that the audience can go, Ooh, let's not step into that. So, um, the, the hardest part is picking my battles, uh, a little bit better. Um, nice, baby. <laughs> yeah. And, and learning that like, I, I'm not in an outpatient setting where I can just call the doc and do like what, like in my job at physical, I had borderline complete autonomy um, right. to be able to do whatever I want. Cause the PT was there. I could say, Hey, I'm going to call the doc cause this isn't doing well and that'll take it off your plate. And 99% of the time, like, yeah, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, so now that I'm in, and this is part of like why I want it. Cause I wanted to see the big picture. Like why aren't these things being done? Oh, you know, because there's things going on. Great. Like what things are going on that we can't get these things done? Like somebody just explain that to me and then we're all good. Right. Um, so the picking the battles is definitely, I still fight probably more battles than I should. Um, but I'm much more selective on how hard I push with them. Yeah. Um, especially when interacting with like the director of re or director of uh, nursing, um, the nursing staff themselves, um, and then my uh, regional director. Um, so I'm much more selective about how how much I do and how hard I push with some things. Whereas when I was a staff member, um, and my clinic director can attest to this and how much she loved it, um, every little thing that came up, like I was bugging her about it every day until something got taken care of. Yeah. Um, so I'm much more selective on, on that, um, decisions that I've made that you would do differently. Nothing, no significant decisions that I would have made differently yet. Again, I'm still early into the role, so there hasn't been, you know, a lot that I've had to significantly, uh, uh worry about it. And with unfortunately COVID, our, our caseload has just been fluctuating a lot. So there hasn't been a lot that I've had to worry about on that end. Right. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm really hoping that, you know, all the things that I put into like speculation of, oh, in this situation, I'll do this. I'm really hoping that those kinds of things, you know, continue on and that I actually follow through with, with right. what my morals and values are. That's cool. I mean, one, I, I went from being a, you know, a, a staff radio DJ to being the program director, which is like a director of rehab or a pro, you know, a clinic director. Yep. And I was younger than a lot of the staff and even yep. the staff that I was older than they were at that station longer than me. So I was the new guy and younger yep. 
And I remember my dad, who was a firefighter, so nothing to do with nothing to do with radio or anything. And he just goes like, "Well, first of all, he put it in great perspective. I was so nervous, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat." Um, and he's like, "Jimmy, like anybody gonna die if you screw up?" And I was like, "Well, no." And he's like, "Nothing's gonna catch on fire. No one's gonna bleed out." I was like, "No." And he's like, "Okay, so relax." And I was like, "Okay, that actually made me feel better." I was like, "Okay, yep. it's just a radio station," but I cared about it, which is why yep. my stomach hurt. And then he said this. He said, "Do you want to get it right?" Or be right. You need to ask yourself that mm. question a lot. And I was like, well, they're the same because I was 25. Yep. I'm like, well, they're the same. He's like, no, no, no. Do you want to get it right or do you want to be right? They're different. I was like, what do you mean? And of course, he's like drinking scotch and he's like pausing. Sure. So this is why I remember this. <laughs> like, if you want to get it right, it just means that you are there to get the job done. Yep. Right. It's amazing what can happen when you don't worry about who's getting credit. If you want to be right, it means you want to get into fights and you want to win them. Whether yep. you're right or not, whether it's right or not, I should say. Yeah. And that really put things in perspective and kind of similar to what you were saying, like choosing your battles. It was like, okay, am I, is this an ego thing where I just want to be right? Or is this person actually saying something that is right? And now we want to get it right. Because in those situations, I learned the person who argued, and I'm using air quotes for the podcast uh, audience, the person who argued the least, the person who listened the most, evaluated, yeah. assessed, and said, okay, the person who talked the least, typically was aiming to get it right versus be right. The person who wants to be right, they're going to try to out talk you with those. So that's great that you recognize this, which leads to our, this question. Trace has got a good, a good question to kind of parallel good old trace. Uh, you've reached director rehab as a PTA in your second year out of school, which kudos to you on that one. Much appreciate. What's next for you? How do you, where do you look ahead now? You kind of um, halfway through school. What's next? So I'm actually uh, applied for a master's of health administration program Good for um, you. out of Wichita State. Um, so here's the hope, and I can get into that in the next cycle or two. Um, ultimately, my, my goal is to move up, and, and I think the phrasing I say, I want to move up high enough to be able to make the decisions that have the biggest impact, right? So yeah. as a director of rehab, I have a certain amount of, re of, of impact but we're also a contract company. So I don't have like direct impact with the facility that we're contracted with. Say that um, again, say that line again. You want to, you want to have the, the city. move up the ladder high enough yeah. to have as big of an impact as possible. I think yeah. I said it a little bit better the first time, but I don't know exactly said. how I said it. And the reason I wanted you to repeat it, like, dude, there's your, if you get an interview anywhere, say mm -hmm. that. If I was listening to someone across from me and they were like, they said that, I'd be like, never mind, cancel the rest of the interviews. We got it. That's <laughs> the answer right there. We got our guy. Absolutely. And that's, that's ultimately what I want to do. And I, I just Good. feel like the quickest way to do that, because I'm crazy impatient, um, <laughs> is to get the master's degree and then apply for a job, you know, higher than that. You know, hopefully yeah. I would love to stay with the company I'm at and move up within them um, ultimately. But, you know, if, if that doesn't work out, you know, happy to entertain offers. Um, impact, dude. Impact. Exactly. Any, so, any organization you work for, if, if they're seeing you grow and because your goal is impact and just just to revert back what i just said your goal is to get it right not be right yeah your goal isn't to get a bunch of titles your goal is impact any company would be if they're if they're not trying to st keep you around pay attention yeah and that's and that's ultimately what it is right and that's for you know anybody out there if you're if you're trying to make a positive impact and your company is inhibiting that or you know actively creating barriers to yeah. to creating a positive impact you know, time to look elsewhere. You know, if you can't quickly move up to be able to be that change, you know, we like the, the saying, go be the change you want to see in the world. But, you know, within reason, right, you can't spend your own mental health. You can't spend 10 years trying to work your way up in a company right. that is just draining and absolutely just tearing you apart in the hopes of getting to a position where you can change it. Yeah. Right. Work your way up faster somewhere else and then try to come back on top yeah. and say, okay, I know how this works before I have the experience and the education. Now we're going to change. Yeah. Um, so the, the big thing that kind of set that off for me too, is watching as COVID was, um, you know, really accelerating, just seeing all the stories of all the MDs and nurses and things like that. I'll follow on Twitter talking about how, you know, the admin staff would tell them not to wear masks because it's scaring patients. The admin staff is telling them about their productivity and making sure they're doing all their things, but the admin's doing all their work from home and, you know, safety from home. Okay. So like you. those, those kinds of things are just, you know, you don't get it unless you're in it. Right. And I, I think that admin hospital admin should be healthcare providers first and then admin second. Right. Cause then they actually get it. Right. And that's sure. where I've had disagreements with, um, 
higher ups and, and companies that I've worked for is like, they tried to say one thing, but I'm just like, I'm a clinician. I'm working with these people every day. Like I know how this directly impacts them and we need to do something different, but they have 20 years of experience in their non healthcare related field. So everything that I say just gets drowned out. All right. right? So I think you need yep. to be a healthcare provider first and then an admin second to actively be able to advocate for patients accordingly and correctly and be able to have a positive impact and change. Yeah, to do as I say, not as I do. And, and people exactly. say, like, don't listen to what someone is saying. Watch what they're doing, right? Are they tipping their hand? Because yep. if you listen, someone can talk in circles, man. I, I talked for a living. I can talk in circles. But I will tell you, don't listen to what I'm saying. Watch what I do. That's yep. what they're doing. And yeah, would you ever ask someone to do something you wouldn't do yourself? If, if, you're say, if that's the case, then, you know, no bueno. Uh, exactly. Um, all right. Uh, let's bring in producer uh, Juliet. We're going to bring her in. We're going to do What's Brewing. Come in the studio. You have your own music. You have your own hype music. Oh, yeah. This is part, <laughs> this is brought to you by right. Medical Staffing, uh, A U R E U S Medical.com, Travel PT, mm-hmm. hashtag Travel PT. Um, what's Brewing? We've got other shows coming up next week. We want to, this is called the front cell. We want to forward tease. Yep. So what we have actually just after this is Sarah Cruiser and Mark Silowick. They're with PT Health Study, and they're going to be talking about their wearable technology with health. Wearables and how we can track people. This is like population health. This is true. And if we hear population health, you probably should think of Mike Eisenhart. Yeah, they're related. It's all yes. they're they're gonna talk about it. Mike Eisenhart's related. What else? Episode, got? I think so. <laughs> um, so yesterday we had two episodes as well. We had Jamie Schreier, and he was talking to us about his target audience with his uh, clinic and yeah. how you define that. And we had Nick Housley. And he was he cool. Was, yeah, he was so cool. And he was with Modus Rehab talking about tele rehab and robotics. Yeah. If you want to get on the show real quick, mention robotics because I'll anything with technology. Really? We'll slide you right in. I'll think it's drones, even though it's probably not. And I'll just get super excited that I'll be like, yeah, come on the show. There you go. And then uh, coming up Tuesday, Kadeem Howell, right? Kadeem Howell on Tuesday and read in Casey Handlery um, from South Carolina. University of Game Game Game. That's some research going on. We met them when yes. we did the show live not long ago. Yep. That's what's brewing. That's what's brewing. All right. It's so look friend. into those guys, okay? Yeah, that's coming. And again, you can get all this, the videos uh, on our Facebook or YouTube, and you can get all the podcasts, obviously, wherever podcasts are downloaded. Perfect. All right. You're for producer Juliet. Thank you so much for what's Thank brewing. So there we Is go. Is that your actual phone number right there? That's my phone number. Yeah, I'm glad you oh, pointed that out. The fact that you pointed that, the bonus points right there for you picking that oh, up. That's a, that's a people, solid that's Gary like, move on there. People are like, that's going to be a Google number. Like, right? It'll be routed yeah. to a Google thing. Dude, that's my phone number. Test it out right now. I want to see if people are actually paying attention because I'm glad you spotted that because I've actually been putting that on the screen for a couple days and no one's texted me. I want to know what you're thinking. When we put someone like Eddie on the show and it's like, there you go. That's it. When we put someone like Eddie on the show and then we have questions blow up, I'm like, yeah, the audience. We just we just, we just, just peaked a nerve right there. We're just pressing our nerve. Someone's calling oh, there me. There it is. Pomona. I don't know who's from Pomona, yeah. but I like it. Oh, that's I, me. I said, te- oh, I said, text me, guys, text oh. me. Um, but I want you guys to, to feel free. Like, this is an open avenue. Like, text me. I want to know who should be on the show. What should we be talking about? Because if you're thinking about it, if you're bitching about it in your car on the way to or from your clinic, let's get it on the show. Let's solve this freaking problem. Yeah. So let's do that. So that is my actual number. We'll keep sharing it. So 845-313-1911. I dare you to text me and we'll get into a conversation and maybe it'll become an episode. Uh, back to the show. Here we go. Uh, let's talk about this. PTAs need to advocate no one better than us, right? This kind of goes along with what I said earlier in the show, which is like, just please do not say, well, I, well, I am just, cause look what I'm doing with my body. I'm just a PTA. And this is what I do. I'm minimizing myself. Don't do it because language matters. So please don't, don't say just. And as you guys are texting me, I like that. I don't even know who these people are, but we're going to find out. Um, don't, don't minimize yourself in the conversation because that means you're never, you're not even getting a seat at the table. You're not getting in the building. So PTAs need to advocate no one better than us. You're someone who's advocating for yourself a lot. But when you go bigger in terms of a profession of physical therapist assistance, what do you think? Well, number one, props to you for saying it correctly because most Thank people you. say physical therapy assistance. Uh uh-uh, uh, physical, physical therapist. therapist assistance. So assistance. props to you on that. Um, so as far as professional advocacy, like like uh, like we're talking about before the show, you gotta 
be at the table and get yourself at the table to have a say, right? We, we, we talk a lot about, and even for me, like I understand that there's a lot of PTAs that don't feel like they have been adequately. And I, for myself too, feel that, that we haven't been adequately advocated for, okay. uh, within the professional organization at large and then also within state chapters, right? So there's a lot of times where there's scope of practice things that come up that will only affect PTs. So, I mean, just uh, manipulations and dry needling are like the two, always the big topics that that are coming up in scope of practices. So we, we see a lot of PTAs that, you know, aren't a member of the APTA because they don't feel like the APTA af accurately represents them and sure. um, advocates for them. You know, the only way that changes though is if you get to the table, right? They don't, they, they will not represent people well if they don't see their voice being heard, right? And we have the PTA caucus and they do an awesome job of, of advocating for us on the professional level and doing all the things there. But that's a small portion of the amount of PTAs that are in you know, the country, right? If we look at just numbers, the, the PTA, the goal for the APTA was to have 10,000 PTA members versus right. like the tens of thousands of PT members. So if we don't have the numbers there, well, I mean, just like any other politician, if you're not showing up to the voting booth, if you're not showing up and donating, like they're, they're going to advocate for the people that are showing up. Yeah. Right. They're not going to advocate for the people that are not showing up because they don't know what those people want. If you're not at the table, and I mean, you can go on my Twitter. I bitch at the PTA, APTA all the time for all the different things that. But are you I, a member? Yes, I am. You're paying attention. Yeah, so I am a member. Um, I'm, you know, uh, Shaw and Bagby that you were talked about, talked to the, the other day. Again, he's, right. he's one of my mentors. He's somebody that has talked me off the ledge multiple times when I want to go on just big old rants. Uh, yeah. on my so he's luckily the cool head to my, to my hot head. Um, but, you know, you have to be at the table and you have to put yourself out there to get a say. And if you don't, you're never going to have one. So that when we're looking at that, we're looking at starting with the state associations, right? You have to inject yourself into the state association and all the little, well, little menial, again, menial rules, um, all the committees, everything that you can inject yourself into as a PTA, do right. that, but don't do it. And this is stuff that Sean Bagby and I actually talked about last week. I think that what kind of just opened my eyes. Don't do it as a PTA, do it as a professional advocate. Right, you're not going and injecting yourself in there to say that, hey, look, I'm a PTA and I'm doing this. You're saying, hey, I'm here to help because no. I want to advocate for the profession as a whole. Right. right. If you do it to purpose, like you were, you were saying earlier, it's not about the credit; it's right. about showing that you care. Yeah. Right. So if you go in showing that you care about the profession, well, then you know, long term, the profession is going to say, well, yeah, these guys act, these guys and gals actually care. Right. They want to help us. Well, we should want to help them too. Right. So you have to interject yourself into those. Um, streams first, and then that can grow yeah. into globally. And again, I'm super impatient. I wish I could just walk into the APTA, right. kick, kick down the door, kick down the red tape, and say these things are going to change tomorrow. But right. unfortunately, that's not going to happen. I'll say this: like, like there, there's a valid argument for feeling like you weren't represented, right? Because yeah. I think when I even when I was in school just a couple of years ago, it was like you guys had a portion of a vote, right? It was less than it was less than a full vote, which I was like, yeah. why would I want to pay for something if I wasn't yeah. being counted, like? this is literally a country where we're like, you get a vote. That, that's the one thing you're actually guaranteed that and taxes and death. You're like, you get these three things guaranteed. Um, that has changed. Good. It took a long time for that to change. Yeah. Please do something with it. So that's actually th funny that you mentioned that. Cause that's one of the most recent things that kind of upset me a little bit, okay, well, yeah. not upset me, but it's like a kind of peep. So the APTA didn't actually give the PTAs a vote. What they did was allow States to give PTAs a full vote. So okay. there's some states that allow PTAs a full vote, some states that still don't, if memory serves correctly. However, within the APTA itself, PTAs still don't have a vote. So the PTA caucus doesn't actually get a vote on any of the RCs and things like that. The okay. sections just got a, a, allowed a vote. Um, so that way the like individual bodies All right. Right. sections, right? They, so they get a vote. And then the PT delegates get a vote. However, PT, PTAs still don't get a specific vote, and PTAs are barred from serving in any role within the state organizations that allow them to get a vote. So president, chief delegate, vice president, anything that you can have a vote with, PTAs aren't allowed to have. So that's where, like, and it's those little nuances, again, that sure. if you're not a PTA that's looking at it, you know, you don't know. So that's something where no, like, you're still me and that I'm going to be working for and that I know the PTA caucus is working for and I know people are working for. Like it's those things where if you are a PTA or PT, a PTA member, 
um, and you're a new grad or you're, you've been in the profession for a while and you're not understanding, you know, why there isn't enough PTA involvement. It's those little things, why there isn't enough PTA involvement. So you as the PTs, like those have been a lot of the PTs that I know that are APTA members have been really, really good advocates, especially some of the new grads that I know, you know, they're all for pushing for more PTA involvement and they've been really good advocates about, you know, injecting good. themselves within the profession to help us out in that in the long run. Yeah. Do you want to get it right or be right? Right. You exactly. can go in there and say, I, want, oh, I want to be right. I'm just going to yell at you from the rafters and I'm going to give you the finger finger. Exactly. Right, and I'm going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to be right. Or we want to get it right. Let's get together so we can get it right. And whatever that right is, yeah. let's, let's move, let's move towards that. And then even when we get there, we're going to kind of look around and go, all right, this is better than it was, but let's eat, let's continue to make this right. And you're saying, if you want to advocate for us, listen, bitching about it all in a Facebook group or, or on Twitter, it feels good. Short yeah. term. You typed it out. You hit send. Lots yeah. of likes and people saying I agree with you. And if that's your therapy, that's your therapy. Um, but we've got what we're we gonna do about it, right? But yeah. I understand. I understand. Where at first it would say, why would I join an, an organization if I don't feel like I'm 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 fully welcome at the table? But it's moving in that direction. I would say, come on in. I would like I would like to welcome you. I'm a member. Let's let's all be let's 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 work on this problem together. Exactly, and that's all it is. Like like the APTA's thing, you know, better. Better together. Uh, You're done. Better together. Better together, and that's you know that's what the APTA is aiming for. And a, a, yeah. a lot of the the higher ups in there, like Sharon Dunn, I've had multiple conversations with her. She's all about PTA. She Love really, it. really is. Um, you know, she her she's not you know it's not a dictatorship. So she can't just hit the gavel and say, okay, we're gonna do everything. We everything is equal now, and everything PTAs and PTs are you know everything equal, right? So you can't just do that. She's not a dictator, and we don't want her to be a dictator because right. dictators aren't good leaders. So right. she's a great leader, and she's very pro PTA. You know, she her hands are tied as much as they are because of the lack of participation. So if the PTAs show up, um, and and participate more you know she has more say she can say like look we have this huge influx of ptas they want to participate they want to be involved you know let's remove the barriers to them getting involved and you know with how, how strong her leadership is within the profession yeah. you know, i have no doubt that people would listen i like that uh we're gonna do shameless self-promotion this is a part of the show <laughs> where we have you look right into the camera look right into the camera and say hey i'm eddie ernst and you're listening to pt pinecast hey I'm Eddie Ernst, and you're listening to PT Podcast. That's perfect. All right, it's time for three questions. Are we ready to do three questions? Let's do that right now. Let's do sure. three questions. All right, here we go. Three questions brought to you by our friends at Arius Medical Staffing. That is A-U-R-E-U-S medical.com. I'm going the wrong way. A-U-R-E-U-S medical.com. Uh, leaders in uh, hashtag travel physical therapy, you're essential. You're a physical therapist. You're a physical therapist assistant. You're looking for positions to be essential. Some of you, maybe you're a new grad right now, and you're saying, man, get me a job where I can do the thing I've been studying for for the last few years. A-U-R, E-U-S medical.com. Uh, positions in all 50 states, all different settings. A lot of times people think, well, travel PT is just outpatient, outpatient. It's not. It isn't. And a lot of times they're like, well, it's in places I don't want to go. All the time. Listen, I don't know where your jam is. But if your jam is Alaska or Hawaii, they do have positions there. If your jam is Kansas, they got positions there. So whatever drives you, let, let them drive you there. A-U-R-E-U-S medical.com. First question is a where question, Eddie. Okay. You can go anywhere in the 50 U.S. states. Where are we going to go? Hawaii. Yeah, why not? I mean. It sounds cliche, but my reasoning is, so I have an intrinsic fear of either stepping on a jellyfish or getting eaten by a shark. So I don't like, like I lived in California. I don't like that I can't see through the water. So yeah. it's really just like I'll go to Fiji or, or Bora Bora. Like anywhere the water is clear where like, I can see if something's coming after me, yeah. that's really all it is. But Hawaii is just, just the default just because that's in the U.S. That's so. that's why. Yeah. Uh, second question is a what question. Something you've read, listened to, downloaded a podcast, book, movie, some, a quote, poem. Yeah. What you, something you think would, the audience would benefit from, from consuming. Um, so two actually. So the first one that, uh, I read was how to lead when you're not in charge. Um, so that was a, a book and I don't remember the author, but it was a book specifically about like starting to try to create change, like be who you want to be, yeah. um, in terms of a leader, um, do the, do as I say, not as I do kind of thing. Right. So being an active leader within an organization when you're not in charge to help enact change, to increase your influence. Yeah. Um, and then the second one was a podcast that I listened to on my drive from Nevada to Kansas, which was uh, the first time manager. 
I think it was called, but it was a couple hours long, but just like little tidbits, five, 10 minutes at a time episodes of like, hey, don't do this, do this. Like, this is how you handle this situation. This is how you handle this yeah. situation. Um, you know, luckily I haven't had to use too much of the don't do this situation or, you know, the because it was much on the, the extreme. Because oh, no. a lot of times that's in your brain. Now you're sure. like, well, I'm sure. sure. Hold on a second. I've, I've seen this before. Yeah. I've felt this danger feeling before. So you've done it. That's cool. I like that. First time manager. Uh, last thing, it begins and ends with people, Eddie. Who's someone the audience should know more about? Oof. Um, I mean, Sean Bagby, you know, Diane Yates, the PTA caucus really just as a whole um, it, it, because they're doing so, so much good for, for the profession as a whole and for us PTAs. Um, so on a professional level, I'll say just anybody on the PTA caucus, like go on your state association website, who's the PTA caucus member, talk to them. What issues are they worried about? What are they trying to advocate for? You know, get on the same page as them. Know it. Um, professionally, a little shameless plug would be uh, – the Stephen T. Arena and Mickey Shaw, um, they're doing really, really great things with the vestibular rehab. They're really diving into it and trying to create kind of the um, the next Emory, essentially, of having that, you know, the Emory is the five-day intensive, and then right next to that is Evidence CEU in terms of vestibular rehab cool. um, courses, really going in-depth um, with everything. So, All right, that's uh, that's three questions. A-U-R-E-U-S-Medical.com. Last thing we do is your parting shot. Yeah. Party shot brought to you by our friends from the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy, orthopt.org. If you're thinking about enhancing, leveling up, as the kids these days are saying, your uh, orthopedic knowledge and skills, doing it from the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy is probably a pretty good idea. Orthopt.org. We have a we have a co a contest coming. You can win access to a couple of their different uh, their their course offerings. So if you're in our in our unfair advantage email. You will have first crack at that. In fact, in your, if you're in the unfair advantage email, you're actually already registered for the contest. We haven't even launched yet. You're already in just by being in. So check that out at ptpinecast.com. Parting shot, Eddie, your chance for a mic drop moment. What's the thing you want to leave the audience with? Oh, man. Uh, be you and and advocate for yourself and your patients, really. I, let's just do that. Advocate for yourself and your patients, right? So when you have a, a goal in mind of how you want to be as a clinician, um, do every invest everything you have into that, right? And, and CEUs, right? Go to in for, in person courses, not just pre recorded online. Pre recorded online is great, but go to those in person courses. Connect with other people, network, right? If you feel like you're not fulfilled in your role, you know, move up. You know, get extra education. It's it's easy to say, hard to do. So do all the things that you need to do to be professionally fulfilled. Yeah, doing the right thing is always the right thing. Uh, Eddie, appreciate your time. Absolutely, uh, really thank you. When you're on the show, we'll have you back again soon. There's the socials right there. Uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks for sharing, man. Appreciate it. Cheers. Absolutely. Cheers, brother. Thank you for having me on.